We are digging into a series that we've called Counter Culture. Counter Culture, and in this series, we're just looking at, at how Jesus, if you didn't notice, he ruffled some feathers. You ever notice that about Jesus? He went against the grain. He swam upstream. He was counter culture, and he taught us what it looked like, though, to be in the world but not of the world, to know that this world is not our home. But it's interesting, Jesus in the very world, the very culture that he went counter to, he showed us in being counterculture how we can love that very group of people that may drive us crazy, the very group of people that maybe we're going counterculture to. He showed us how to love in a way that changed the course of history. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that description, it seems quite impossible for a guy like me. Anybody else want to say amen to that? Uh, it's like, how do we even do that? But the beauty of our Savior is Jesus didn't just give us a command and a commission and say, go do this. He showed us how. And so in this series, Counterculture, we decided, let's start with generosity. And so last week we started with that because, listen, generosity is such a huge part of what it looks like to be counterculture. And counterculture, generosity, we're in our second week, but if, even if you're just catching up with us, uh, this will stand alone just fine today. But we're in part two of just a little two-week mini-series within the series. We'll be in Psalm 50, and I brought some quarters with me today since we're talking about money. Uh, some of you who were here last week uh, remember I did the quarter catch challenge. I mean, anybody ever done the quarter catch challenge where you put it on your elbow and you try to catch it? I need a volunteer who just has a little, you don't have to have hardly any experience. If you've ever done that before, would you lift your hand for just a minute? And you, and you wouldn't mind helping me out? I need, a, I need somebody to help me. Come on, raise your hands. Still, don't be shy. Don't make me come pick on you. Anybody? All right, hey, can, can you come up here? One of you that raise your hand over there? Can you make it to the front? Oh, not you. Somebody back behind you, raise your hand. Come on, come on, come help me out. All right. While he's making his way up here, uh, I'm going to just give you a refresher. And so you can watch, learn on the fly here. I'm going to just do one. Uh, last week I did, what did I do? A dollar? Did I do a dollar? Four. Okay, this is one. All right. There you go. That's one. That's all you got to do. Can you do that? You think so? He's going to try it. What's your name? Sean. This is Sean. Everybody give it up for Sean. All right, Sean. How are you, man? Good. All right, you want to give it a shot? Let's try one. Let's just do one together, me and you both. <laughs> Didn't nobody see it. Don't worry. It's not like the lights are on us or anything like that. So, All right, ready? One, two, three. Hey, fist bump. We both got it. Right. You want to try for a dollar? Sure. All right, let's go for a dollar. All right, there's three more. I'm going to get me a few more here. That's four, right? Yep. Make sure they're not cheating. We'll hold each other accountable. Y'all ready for this? All right, you can, oh, I don't. I'm just trying to make you feel better. You ready? One, two, three. Ah, oh, good try. You can, you can pick those up. You can give that to Blackhawk on your way out in just a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, hold on, don't leave, don't leave, come back. Come on, we won't give you a chance to redeem yourself. You don't have to pick them up now, that's all right. Sean, Sean's the man, this guy's a servant. He's just cleaning up after, yeah, give it up for Sean. Well, you want to go for a dollar again? You want to go a buck fifty? Okay, I like your spirit, man. Let's do it. All right, I'm gonna do that too. All right, I got mine here too. That's the same, right? Yep. All right, let's do it. That's six of them. Y'all ready for this? Open the ante a little bit. Ready? One, two, three. Hey, look at you. Let's go two dollars. You want to try it? Two fifty. Oh, he said. I said let's go two dollars. He said let's go two fifty. All right. I'm gonna get mine here. There's that, let's see, one, two, and I need two more. I'm going to grab yours there. All right, we're going $2.50. All right, how many is that? Just help me with my math. How many quarters? 10, all right, just making sure you're awake. You got your 10? All right, here's my stack. You saw me count it. I don't know if we can do 10. 10's pretty hefty there, but we'll give it a shot. That's right, yeah, you guys better, you better uh, get your goggles on, really, for sure. One two, three. Hey, nice. I think that was mine. I think you beat me. I'm sure that one was mine. You can grab that and you keep your quarters. Y'all give it up for Sean. <laughs> All right. See, y'all should have volunteered. You could have made $2.50. Ten quarters could have been yours. And you don't even have to give that. You can go buy yourself a Coke or something like that with that. So, hey, here's what we're hoping for you. That's just a fun way of looking at the fact that Jesus knew something that we know and that we hope we can pour over your life is we want to help you get a grasp 
to catch your finances before they catch you. Jesus knew that they would. He talked in some, almost half of his parables about money, possessions, and stuff. Uh, Do you know there's about 500 verses in the Bible about prayer, and there's four times that, over 2,000 verses about our money, possessions, stuff, and stewardship. So that's where we're starting with counterculture generosity, so we can get a grip on that stuff before it gets a grip on us, because today's culture would have us be gripped by finances and gripped by what it means to look generous or not to look like what God has. And here's what I'll tell you if you're coming and you're like, man, I come to church and the pastor's talking about money. Listen, Jesus nor this church, we don't want something from you. We all want something for you. Jesus isn't trying to get your money. He just doesn't want your money to get you. He wants to help you get your arms around it. And I've told you, uh, you won't hear this from many pastors, if your obstacle is like, oh, he's just saying this so that I'll give it Blackhawk. I would even tell you, I do believe, and I'll explain why I believe in giving to the Lord through the local church today. But listen, if that's your biggest obstacle in hearing what God wants for you today, give, but give somewhere else, just so you can test God in this. I believe in it that much, and I believe that God will align your heart with his and the local church. So that said, we wanna talk about counterculture generosity, and I'm so thankful that God gave uh, to us. And we've had a memory verse that we started last week. We're gonna try it, we don't put it on the screen yet, but we're gonna try it without it first. And you guys can test me, I'll test you. If you are here last week, the rest of you are off the hook. And listen, if, if, if you don't know it, and you were here last week, just act like you weren't here last week. Most people won't know the difference. All right, let's try to say it together. Psalm 50, verse 14, offer to God, a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high. I saw a lot of you right, even ahead of me in that. That is awesome. Y'all like, speak faster. Let's do it again. Ready? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high. High. There's something about seeing and reading the word of God, so let's read it together one more time. Psalm 50, verse 14, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high. And we are breaking that verse into four parts. Four principles, four points. I shared two of them with you last week, and I'm gonna share two more with you today as this little mini-series kicks off our counterculture generosity series. Point one was preparation. Beginning part of the verse, offer to God. If you're gonna give a sacrifice, certainly in the Old Testament system, but even today, it requires preparation. You've got to pre-decide, pre-determine, pre-choose to do some things. So we talked about preparation, offer to God. Number two, we talked about praise. What do we offer to God? A sacrifice of thanksgiving. And if you missed last week's message, blackhawk.fyi is your friend. You can catch up with us, but even if you didn't, today we're gonna go into points three and four. Number three is promise. Promises, write that down, promises. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows. These are promises. God is faithful. God is a God of promises. God is a God of covenant. We sung about that today. But God wants us in turn to follow his lead and to make promises and to be intentional about our commitments, our vows to him as well. Psalm 50 is all about a psalm, a declaration of what God declares over his people, of what he desires from his people, and even what he despises that he gets from his people. Read Psalm 50. And so it's a picture of worship for us, and giving is certainly a picture of that. And so promises, perform your vows. How many of you... Before I make my next statement, I'll ask you this question. How many of you sometimes, you'll just admit, you'll be vulnerable, I sometimes struggle with follow through. Would you lift your hand? Sometimes I have good intentions, I meant well, but I just don't get it across the finish line. That was a lot of us, and I appreciate you guys. This is a place we can just be who we are and bring all of our mess to the table. But I'll tell you this about follow through, that follow through really is a spiritual discipline of our faith. Intentions versus intentionalities. You know what they have in common? The word intention. Intentionality has the word intention in it, but they're very different things. Sometimes we mean well, but don't end up being able to follow through or choosing to follow through on what we meant well about. And one of my favorite stories about that is a farmer. I know we got one or two farmers in the building. I grew up around a cattle farm. My granddad, who went home to be with the Lord earlier this year, uh, was a cattle farmer. And so I got to be there when you got the calves up and they would sell the calves. And you know, it's, it's, it's a payday. It's what you do all the work for. And so when a cow, 
has twins. It's a big day. That's a big celebration. You farmers know what I'm talking about. And so this farmer uh, had twin calves. One was white, the other was a brownish kind of color, and he went into his wife and they celebrated together. And he said, we have twin calves. The Lord has been so good to us that one of these calves, I declare it right now, one of these calves belong to the Lord. And she said, oh, that's so awesome, I totally agree. And she said, well, which one belongs to the Lord? And he said, it doesn't matter. We're just gonna give half of whatever we make, half of the blessings that these calves give to us, we're just gonna give it to the Lord. And she said, I totally agree. And time went by and the payday came and the farmer came in looking totally opposite than he did the first part of the story and his head was down and he was sad and he told his wife, he said, I got bad news. She said, what's, what's going on? I can tell something's wrong. And he said, well, one of the calves died of the twins, and they were both sad, and it was a big loss. And she said, well, what, what are we gonna do? And, and he said, well, I don't know. And he said, it, unfortunately, it was the Lord's calf. <laughs> and she said, but I thought we, were, we agreed, we were just gonna give half of whatever these, these twins brought. And he said, yeah, you know, I thought about it, and the, it was the white calf that died. And you know, Jesus, you know, there's white robes in the Bible, and, and, and he's the lamb of God, and, and the white calf just kinda looks more like that, so it's the Lord's calf that died, I'm sorry. And there really isn't much more of a punchline to this story. I share it because doesn't that really represent, if we're honest, kind of how we might do things sometimes. Unless we have an eternal perspective, a preparation-driven decision of how we're gonna praise our God, we won't be able to keep our promises. And ultimately, when tough times come, it's the Lord's calf that always goes first. Can I get an amen? If we don't pre-decide our praise, if we don't let intention lead to intentionality, the Lord's calf will always be the first to go when it comes to our generosity, our stewardship of what God has given us. And so write it down this way. I think true eternal investment, earthly versus eternal, true eternal investment only happens when we move from intention to intentionality. And so that's what I wanna try to help you be able to do because intentions never build bridges. Intentions never get us to our destinations. Saying I meant to or I wanted to. uh, You know, have you ever heard the phrase, well, it's the thought that counts. When it comes to the spiritual discipline of follow through in our faith, it's not really the thought that counts. It's a good start. The thought is a good starting place. So you can tell yourself if you need a little encouragement, you can say, you know what? I had a thought and it was a good starting place, but I'm not done. Look at your neighbor, say, I'm not done. Now look back, say, I'm not done just yet either. You tell the other person, we're not done yet because we are gonna follow through and move from intention to intentionality. And so I wanna help you with that today. And Jesus said it this way. Jesus, imagine this, had the best way of putting it all together for us. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Also, I've heard this verse all of my life. I'm a PK, I grew up in the church, and I'd memorized this verse in uh, Awana. Uh, I I remember I was the kid, everybody wanted on their Awana memory verse team. This is one of them. Like, I was the PK and knew the verse, but you know what I didn't know? I didn't know for most of my life that it has a really big dual meaning. It applies in a couple of different areas, and I think I got one pretty well figured out, but the other I often miss. This is the part I often got. I believe your spending reveals your depending. What you spend on reveals what you depend on, is one way you could put it. It, It's an external look at your treasure and your heart. When you look at the two, uh, you'll find that it can reveal your heart, but the second part is that it can refocus your heart. It checks my heart. When I look at where I invest, when I look at my money, when I look at my bank account, when I look at my check register, whatever it is that I look at to keep track of those things, and if you don't, you should probably start that, but wherever I keep track of where I'm spending, it will reveal my heart. It checks my heart. But the second thing that it does is if I will redirect my spending and invest my treasure, my heart will go there. My heart will get refocused. So it externally checks my heart when I look at my spending, but it internally changes my heart to look a little bit more like whatever the priorities are that I'm shifting my giving and my generosity and my finances and my stewardship to. So our hope is that we can check our hearts and see what is revealed as we look at our finances and our stewardship, but also that it can refocus our heart, that we can say, I'm gonna realign some priorities. I'm going to prepare to praise God, make some promises to God, move intentions to intentionalities and giving and generosity in a way that hopefully will allow my heart to better align with the heart of God. 
Maybe you, like me, have missed those two parts to that verse. You get one, it's like, yeah, it checks my heart, and you go, man, I feel bad, and you stop there. But this verse also reminds us where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It's a future kind of tense. So if I put my treasure somewhere else, my heart's gonna naturally move there. Giving, generosity will change your gravity. It changes where you put weight. It changes where you put priorities, which is the fourth point we'll get to a little later today. But as we look at promises here, uh, somebody should ask me, okay, well, if our heart should be about what God's heart is for, somebody should say, well, pastor, what's God's heart for? I'm glad you asked. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, throughout history, you know what God's heart has always been for? We'll often say things like, well, the church is the hope of the world. And we have good intentions when we say that, but I would say, no, Jesus is the hope of the world. But the church is the body of Christ. It's the hands and feet of Jesus. It's the family of God. It's the children of God. It's his sons and it's his daughters. What is God's heart for? God's heart has always been for his church, for his bride, God's heart is for his people. You know what that means? When we think of the gravity of that statement, when I say that, when you and I say that, we are saying God's heart is for me. Wow. Just wow, that God's heart is for me. Jesus is the hope of the world, but his church is the vehicle that Jesus established and said even the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The church is the vehicle Jesus established to carry the hope that is Jesus Christ to a world that is hopeless, His heart is for the church, and it's bigger than a place. It's a people now. We know the people. We know the place. And then people say, well, what about the percentage? I know you're getting there. You said you were going to talk about the tithe. I'm going to talk about the tithe uh, through giving you some outcomes uh, here as we're going to look at those here. But let me tell you what tithing really is. Tithing is the training wheels of trust. I've heard me say that before, but I want to drive that point home. Tithing, and tithe, the word tithe means tenth. People say, well, do I give on 10% of my gross, 10% of my net? I, I think God gave all of it, so I say start with gross. But what you're gonna find is that 10% is just a starting place. That's not what some of you wanted to hear from today's sermon, but just hang with me because I believe it's gonna change your perspective of what it looks like to be a steward, a manager, and to go counterculture and how we're open-handed in our generosity. Tithing, giving a tent, is just the training wheels of trusting God with that which he entrusted to us. Did you know you don't own anything? You thought you did, didn't you? Sorry to burst your bubble. God owns everything. It all belongs to God, but he entrusts components of what he owns, what he created into our hands. And so when we tithe, it's just like training wheels to learn to ride a bike, to trust God more, to build a bigger faith, to have more generosity and more open-handedness in our lives. And unfortunately, today, the average Christian uh, gives, and this is, I think, even bigger than just to and through the local church, uh, about 3% or less of their income. And I think God just has more for us than that. And I'm not here to condemn anybody, just so you know. Uh, listen, if you do this stuff out of guilt because the preacher pointed at you and you're like, man, I dropped my head and I walked out of church feeling all bad about myself, like, you know, it's a good start to maybe try a new discipline, but here's what I've learned. Have you ever done that before? A preacher made you feel bad or somebody made you feel bad and you tried something? How long did it last? I don't know, a week, a day, a few days? For me, about a week, two weeks. I'm not, I'm not into trying to condemn you into giving and and learning this. God has so much more for you. I wanna help you do this, not from a place of guilt, but from a place of overflowing grace. And we're gonna talk about how that can look even right now. So let me give you seven giving outcomes. When we're giving, when we're generous, when we start with the the training wheels of trust, several things are gonna happen. Number one, we're gonna put God first. Write that down. We're gonna put God first. How many of you remember the old, back in the days, McDonald's song describing the Big Mac? I'm not gonna sing it, because then you go to lunch singing it, you'll sing it all week. How many of you knew that in the fast food industry, way back in the day, you didn't get to customize your burger? Did you know that? You get what you get, and you don't pitch a fit. You would get a burger, and that's why the McDonald's had that song, and you would get it, and if you didn't want the onions, well, you just scrape them right off onto a napkin and throw the napkin away. And if you don't like the mustard, well, you just wipe it with a napkin and you eat the burger. If you want the burger, you get what you get, right? And then came a new song from a competitor called Burger King. And it changed the course of the fast food industry when it came to burgers. And their song ultimately led to this slogan, say it with me if you know it, Have it your way. And the song, and how many of some of you know that song too, right? And it changed the course of what burgers look like. Now you can say, hold the mayo. I don't want those nasty onions. You can tell I don't like onions. And by the way, I'm not against uh, customizing burgers. I customize mine too. I don't like the onions on mine, all right? So some of you do. So 
I'm not against that, but here's what it shows us. That shift in culture, that shift in fast food also represents culture. We're talking about counterculture. Well, culture says, have it your way. Culture says, hey, it's all about you. Do what serves you the best. Do what will further your agenda, your plans. So to be counterculture in our generosity means to be counterculture in who it's about. And we start to say, Jesus, you didn't make life about you. You said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. You didn't come to say, I'm gonna have it my way. And he could have, by the way, because he kind of created all of you and me and the world and everything you walked on and everything he touched. But he didn't. He showed us humility. And he showed us what it looks like to put God first. And he gave like God gave. And here's what happens when we put God first. I'm gonna talk to you about the principle of first fruits, which is what leads into tithing and go through those principles. I, I didn't leave that alone there. But when we put God first, then what we'll do naturally next is we'll put other people first. And then you have a formula for joy. Write this down, Jesus, others, yourself. That's a formula for joy in your life. Put Jesus first, put others second, put yourself last. That's what Jesus did. And when we're generous, we put God first. The principle of first fruits uh, actually came at the beginning of your Bible, even with Cain and Abel, they, they gave to the Lord out of the first fruits of what they had, the best of what their land produced, they gave the first fruits. This is the beginnings of that. And, and so from there, you'll find Deuteronomy chapter 14 talks about the principle of first fruits, and you see it pre-law with Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis. You see it uh, even in the law with Moses. You see it post-exile with Malachi chapter three. We're gonna read that verse in just a minute. And Jesus in Matthew 23, I think it's verse 23, affirms this principle of tithing, the training wheels of trust, as I often call them. So you see it in Old Testament, New Testament, throughout the history of the church. And listen, I'm not here to convince you of that percentage. I'm just saying it's a great place to start. It is God's ask of us in the beginning, because here's what I'll tell you. The more we put God first in our generosity, number two happens, we will prove God's promises. Number two, we prove God's promises. In Malachi chapter three, listen, it's the only place in scripture where God says, put me to the test in this. He says, give the tenth, give the tithe, 10%, and see if I won't bless you. That doesn't mean he's gonna fill your bank account. But let's read it together. Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Malachi chapter three, verse 10. Bring the full tithe, tenth, into the storehouse. This is the, the temple, the tabernacle, the church at the time. At that time, it was a place. Now it's a people, as we have looked at. That there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Notice he didn't say, until you have everything you want. No until there is no more need. I will meet your needs. I will supply. This is a promise of God. So when we are generous, we put God first, and therefore we put others first, put ourselves last. We look more like God. We prove the promises of God. And then number three, we practice God's plan. God has a plan to help you be a more generous person, to look more like him. We practice God's plan because, get this, the tithe, the tenth, the Old Testament principle. Some of you are like, I don't have to do that. It's Old Testament. And, and in some ways, you're right. Jesus affirmed that. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus comes along. And the New Testament, the New Covenant, the gospel, Christ himself, he took those principles and he put them on steroids he blew them up. John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, I'm gonna give you a new command. And he said, love one another. And they're like, that's not new. But he said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not finished just yet. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Loving one another wasn't new. Doing it the way Jesus did it was very new. Nobody had ever done it that way before. And here's what happens. The early church started to overflow in their generosity as they learned to love as God loved them. As they learned to love each other the way that Jesus had taught them to love, they started to give as God gave as well. Acts chapter four is a picture of the early church and we use this with our, we call it our 100% challenge. We always set numerical goals uh, at the end of the year with our year-end offering that we do. We call it Give Light. Many of you participated in that. It's a great onboard even into the continuation of generosity and we support missionaries all throughout the year just like we do at year end. It's not just a year end thing for us and we'll set a numerical goal but our biggest goal is 100% participation that every one of us participate in the offering. Not with equal amounts but with equal 
sacrifice. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, is a picture of what that can look like. It's the early church, right? Let's read this together. Acts 4, 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. That doesn't sound like 10% to me. It sounds a little bigger. And then what happened? But they had everything in common. Later the chapter says that, and then there were no needs among them. It sounds like the promise of God in Malachi started to get fulfilled in the early church in Acts chapter four, if you ask me. And that's the formula that Jesus came. And so you say, well, should I tithe? Yeah, absolutely. And then some. You didn't want to hear this, but you know what Jesus does? He takes 10% and says, now make it 100. And look at everything that you think belongs to you as mine. And when you do that, and listen, I'm not saying don't pay your mortgage. Don't be calling your bank and saying, well, the pastor told me not to pay my mortgage. Just give it to the church, give it to the Lord. No, don't be doing that. But what God does want you to do is plan to be generous. Prepare your praise. Make your promises and maybe shift your promises so that they look a little more like the priorities of God in your life. And you make a way, you make intentionality flow into your generosity to where you can look at everything God gives you as something he has entrusted to you. It's all his anyway, so anything he gives me, I just hold it loosely and I have open hands. I'll give as God says give. When it makes sense, I'm going to give. When it doesn't make sense, I'm going to give. That's what God challenges us to do. I'm thankful for people who gave in my life. My granddad I talked about that was a farmer is one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. My parents were always generous, always helping people. Jessica's parents always had somebody in their home, always giving, always sacrificing to help other people. So I thank God for people like that. And I pray that I can be Yet another example of that, don't you? It's like when people think of me, they think of, well, he's just generous. He just, everything was open-handed. And I'll never forget when I got my first maybe $10 bill or a $10 check, uh, my dad sat down and taught me. And we had a little bank. We had the three categories. It was the church, it was spending, and it was fun. We had a little fun part two in there. And I still remember that little bank. And I put the quarters in there. I didn't even have that many quarters uh, that we dropped on the ground even today. Sean, good job today, man. You preached well today. But I'll never forget just being taught like, hey, if you get a $10 bill, you need to break it into ones because at least $1 needs to, needs to go to the Lord. Give it at church. And I would do that. And now our kids do that. And I can tell you that because of that legacy of generosity, and it's never too late to start. I don't care if you did that when you are a kid. You could start right now. I can tell you that Jessica and I, when we didn't have it and when we did have it to give, we've just given up and above and beyond that. And I say that not out of boastfulness, there's times we didn't have it, and the Lord would have to come through in some really weird ways. But what I found is that 90% goes further than 100%. God says, test me in this. And some of you are looking at me like, you crazy, pastor. I, I'm just preaching what the word says, brother, sister. Just give it a shot and let God show you how he provides. It won't be the way you think. It won't be what you think. But it puts God first. It proves his promises. It practices his plan. Number four, it personalizes God's word personalizes God's word. We often say go biblical before you go digital in the mornings because we want God's word to have the first say and the final say in everything that we do. And throughout God's word, we see this principle of generosity. James 1 verse 22 reminds us, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so when we're generous, the outcome is that we personalize God's word. We practice God's word. We make it actionable in our life. Number five, we prioritize God's provision. We prioritize God's plan. We prioritize God's purpose. What we do is we prioritize his provision above my own provision. In Luke chapter six, chapter 16, you'll see parables. You'll see pictures of how when we're faithful with a little, God will give us much. And that doesn't mean if you're faithful with a little, you're gonna get the bank accounts you dreamed of. It's not the prosperity gospel, but it's also not the poverty gospel that God wants us to have nothing. God does entrust us with more. Some of us are at different places, but as our faith stretches, God will entrust us with new opportunities, new opportunities to be faithful, new opportunities to steward. And when we give, we prioritize God's provision over my own provision. Some of us are really good at trusting in how good we are at providing for ourselves and our family, but God wants to stretch our faith so that we would prioritize his provision in our faith and in our family. Philippians chapter four, the apostle Paul writes about this, verse 19, and he says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I wanna remind you, my God's loaded. 
He, he created the whole universe. And according to his riches, that's what he's got to pull from to resource you and to provide for you. And my God has been faithful to me. There have been times I haven't had what I wish I had. There have been times where he didn't provide the way I thought he'd provide or the way I wish he would have provided. But my God has provided for me. He provides what I need to accomplish his purposes. And sometimes that means it's through a shortage. Did you know that? Because some of y'all are are thinking like, good, I can do this and I have, I always have plenty. No, sometimes God's purposes is to use your shortage and your weaknesses as a stage to showcase his strength through you who is weak. Therefore, when I'm weak, he is made strong. I decrease, so he increases. I'm not saying God's gonna give you plenty, but he's gonna supply everything you need to do everything he's called you to do. He doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called. And according to his strength and power and his provision, we can prioritize it when we give. Number six, we praise God's name. We praise God's name. I don't know that there's a better way to worship God than to be generous. I'll often say I don't know that we could ever look more like God than when we're giving, because John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave, that God gave, and so let's worship God through our generosity, being generous people, and we give to him through our church, and when we do, number seven happens, and that is participate in God's work. Some of us are buying into a lie right now, I don't wanna speak to it for a second. Some of you are buying into the lie. If you watch media, you scroll social media lately, if you watch the news, you'll be led to believe at some point that God's work in the world is diminishing, that Jesus may not be on the throne anymore, that God's church is going under, that a global pandemic could shut it down, that all of these people who oppose the word of God could shut it down, and some of us are buying into that, and it leads us into this place of fear, but I came to remind us today that Jesus is still on the throne. He's seated at the right hand of God, And he's sitting down because he's not stressing over the stuff that we're stressing about. He is in control. We're taking a team to Africa in just under two weeks, and we're going to see that the work of God is alive and well throughout all generations and all nations. And God is true. His word is true. He is faithful. Jesus was right when he said, I will build my church, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That's the team that we are a part of. If you believe that, give God some praise in this place today. God's still at work. And listen, if God's still at work in the world, don't miss this. God's still at work in you. And if God's still at work in you, God's still going to work through you. God's not done with you yet. In Jesus' name, do you believe that? We get to participate in God's work when we're generous, but just when we trust God, when we open our hands and believe God is who he says he is, and when we give to God through what his heart is for. The local church, we support missionaries and mobilize people and ministries all around the world. When you're generous beyond the walls of the church, you participate in the work of God. But godly generosity, listen, make sure you write this down and catch this. Godly generosity comes from overflowing grace, not from overwhelming grace guilt. If you just give because a preacher guilted you into it, it won't last. And I would say just hold on to it a little while longer until you can give out of a place of grace. You won't hear pastors say that very often either. But that's the, the call of God. That's the generosity God has called us to. Let's give from a place of overwhelming, overflowing grace, not this overwhelming guilt where we just do it out of a have to. We do it out of a get to, out of a want to in our life. I'll never forget my kids teach you about generosity a lot, by the way. You ever notice that? Uh, my son, uh, one of the first years we were here, we were doing a year-end offering, and, and I'll never forget, we always give them an envelope, too, and they give, and we talk about why we do that and those kind of things. It's a great time to teach when uh, you're giving, but you gotta do it first if you're gonna teach your kids to do it, and so Jessica and I always have tried to do that, and imperfectly, but we've tried to pass on that legacy, and my son, one time, he, I was telling him about the goals that we set and the missionaries we were trying to support, and and I'll never forget what he did. Um, he said, oh, well, we need to meet that goal. I said, I know, that's why we're all giving. That's, that's why it's really important. We all participate, let's all jump in. He said, no, 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 we can meet it right now. And I went, okay, well, what, is, what do you think that looks like? He said, just give me your wallet. 
He did, dead serious. Just give me your wallet. It's just the faith of a child to say, well, just do it. And then I had to teach him that, you know, if I wrote that check, uh, it would bounce from here to the moon. And then he said, well, what's a bouncing check? Well, it doesn't bounce, it's paper. You know, we had to do all that kind of stuff. But the faith of a child taught me in that moment to just take the step. When it makes sense, take the step. When it doesn't make sense, take the step. Do it from a place of overflowing grace, not because you're guilted into it. Step across that line this year. Start with the training wheels and build on it from there. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Why can I say that from the pulpit? Because God said, test me in this. And I believe he'll open the windows of heaven to show you his will and his purposes in your life. Last thing is number four, and it's the end of our verse, is priorities. We talked about promises for the bulk of our time, but I want to spend a couple of minutes on priorities. Who do we give to? Offer to God, we already got that, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high. Simple question, who's the most high in your life right now? Who sits on the throne of your life? Is it you or is it Jesus? Some of you may remember the illustration I gave. We had a throne up here. Rick, I think you, were, you played Jesus. He did it. He was a fine Jesus. But I said, scoot over a little bit. Don't we do that? It's like, well, you've got the throne, but scoot over. I'm going to share it with you for a minute because you're just kind of getting it all wrong. <laughs> uh, and, and we laughed like, that sounds sacrilegious. Uh, that sounds heretical. I mean, yeah, it is, but don't we do it? I do that sometimes in my life. So I ask you, who sits on the throne of your life today? Is it Jesus? And what I'll tell you if you want an indicator for that is write this down. Your promises will always reflect your priorities. We have the promises. We perform our vows to the most high and our promises we make, I had you last week make a list of your investments, a budget if you will. Where are you investing your dollars, your treasure, your time, and your talent, your resources? And it'll reflect where your priorities are. And that's where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. If you shift the dollars, you shift your time, you shift your treasures, your talent, your focus, it'll refocus, it'll change your heart, and it'll also help you align better with God's priorities. And there's a perfect illustration with my kids. There's somebody even in the room right now, a dear family that invested in my children. If you wanna to get to the, a father's heart, love on my babies, right? Can I get an amen, parents and grandparents, right? Well, there's a family in this room that was very generous to my kids, and they wanted to give them money that was a missionary adventure fund, is what they called it. And it had three rules, I may botch it a little bit, but it was you have to, with your parents, you have to pray and ask God what his will would be for this money. And it wasn't like five bucks, it was, it was a bunch of money. The kids were like, wow, when they got it. It was, ask God what he wants you to do with the money. Work with your parents and, and, and give, give that money, uh, but it has to be not for yourself. You have to spend it on something that's not you. You have to spend it beyond yourself. And then number three, just come back and tell us what God told you to do and tell us about it. That was it. And man, I have never seen something that maybe would seem so small have such a big impact on my children. I watched them pray. They, I mean, they toiled over that. It's like, man, this is a lot of money. It's more money I've ever seen in my life than I've ever held. And you mean I just get to give it to whoever? Like even that person. And I was like, yep. What about that one? Yep. <laughs> what about, uh, and, and my son, he cared about foster care. And I'd never seen a passion for foster care before. I mean, we've adopted and, and he's been exposed to all that, but I've never seen a big passion. But he developed a passion because of this, because of generosity, because someone made promises to them and they followed through, by the way. They said they were gonna give the money, they gave the money. You see where I'm going with that. The intentions went to intentionalities, but their promises reflected their priorities. They prioritized building up little missionaries. They prioritized investing in the next generation and helping them see what the generosity of God could look like in their life. And I saw passions for my children develop because of this. The power of generosity is amazing. May we prioritize what God prioritizes. And may our promises reflect those priorities. I thank God for that family and for many of you who teach our next generation, our youngsters around here, what it looks like to trust God enough to be generous. To live out Psalm 118 verse 24 that says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Here's what I learned from that verse. It's that God made it and I manage it. God made it. He's the owner of everything. He made it. But I get to manage it. I get to be a steward, a manager of something that's not my own. And as we think about that, we'll start to look a little bit more counterculture with our generosity. And then people will be saying, hey, that, that guy, that gal, that church out at Blackhawk, something a little different about them. And I think I want a little more of it. I want to be that. How about you? 
I want to be that kind of example of counterculture generosity. I want to give you two questions you can ask yourself. Write these down, just like I did last week, to help you apply these principles. The first one is, what do my promises reveal about my priorities? What promises have you made? Where are you investing your time, talent, and treasure? These are the promises, the commitments you've made. What promises that I've made, what do they reveal about my priorities? This is the heart check part. Now I'm gonna give you the heart change part of the question. The second question is, what intentional promises should I pursue to fit God's priorities. This is where we shift our time, town, and treasure to align a little bit more with God's priorities. So what is it that God would have you to align with today? I wanna ask you just to bow your heads, close your eyes, ponder that question. Believers saying, how can I better align with God's priorities? What does it look like right now in my heart? What do my promises reveal about what I prioritize? And how can I shift those priorities to look counterculture, to look a little more like Christ? As believers are praying, some of you right now would say, you know, my priority at this moment is the stirring of the Holy Spirit of God inside of me. I feel it right now that I just don't know that I know that I know that if I were to die today, I would spend forever in eternity in the presence of God because I have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I've got great news for you. The gospel means good news. The good news is that Jesus paid it all for you. Jesus died to pay a price for your sin that you couldn't pay. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus defeated death. Jesus defeated sin. He who lived the sinless life we could never live paid the price by dying in your place. And he rose from the dead. And because he lives, you can have eternal life. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No ifs, ands, buts. It's clear. And God's calling you in your own words right now, in your heart, through prayer. Cry out to him. Ask him to forgive you and save you. Let him know you trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. Not your good works or not somebody else's faith, but Jesus. Jesus is enough. And until he's enough for you, no person, no thing, no action could ever be. Will you trust in him right now as we all ponder, pray, reflect, and ultimately respond in this moment of silence? Take that step right now.